So, Father in heaven, we bow before you in the name of your Son, our Messiah, Yeshua. And we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to gather together. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that you would give us revelation that you would help each one of us, Lord, to comprehend your truth, that we would not just understand it, but that we would also walk in it. So we pray that you would bring about change in each one of us, that we can walk by the light, that we can walk very carefully, that we can live lives that are filled with your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would guide and direct us now. Use the words of my mouth, Lord, to bring change in each one of our hearts. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, last week, I asked the question, who are you imitating? Are you imitating God or are you imitating the world? Well, as believers and followers of Messiah, we know from Ephesians 5.1, we are called to become then imitators of God. So then the question becomes, how do we become imitators of God? Well, Paul spends chapter 5 really answering that question. And in verse 2, he says the very first way that you become an imitator of God is by walking in love. We talked about that last week. And we learned that we walk in love both by laying down our lives for one another and also walking in forgiveness. So I pray that message touched you and you were allowed to really examine your heart to see if there's any areas, any people in your lives where you need to forgive. Well, this week, we're going to continue our study to discover how we can become imitators of God. So open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Master. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is well-pleasing to the Master. And have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather convict them. For it is a shame even to speak of what is done by them in secret. But all matters being convicted are manifested by the light. For whatever is manifested is light." That is why he says, wake up, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Messiah shall shine on you. So then, see then that you walk exactly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are wicked. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the desire of Jehovah is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is loose behavior, but be filled with with the Spirit, speaking to each other in psalms and songs of praise and spiritual songs, singing and striking the strings in your heart to the Master, giving thanks always for all to Elohim the Father and the name of our Master Yeshua Messiah. So in these verses, Paul tells us that in order to become imitators of God, we first walk as light. Then he says to walk precisely or to walk exactly. And then he says to walk in the Spirit. And So we want to explore each one of those things this morning. So first, in order to become an imitator of God, we walk as light light. In verse 8, he says, for you were once in darkness. Now, I think we all understand darkness is simply just an absence of light. So for us to have the ability to understand darkness from a biblical perspective, we need to understand light from a biblical perspective. So how does scripture define light? Well, I want to mention three things that Scripture reveals. The first thing is that God is light. 
John 1, 5 says, And this is the message that we heard from him and announced to you, that Elohim is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is the source of light. His presence brings light and revelation of the truth. Now, we see His presence as light all throughout Scripture. We see it at the beginning, we see it in the middle, and we see it at the end. For example, we see it at the beginning, Genesis 1, verses 2 and 3. We know that creation began as darkness until the Spirit of God moved and the Word of God spoke, and He said, Light be, and light appeared. Then we see it again in Exodus 13, verses 19 and 20. The messenger, or the very presence of God, manifested as a pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. That was the presence of God. Then we see another example of God's presence manifesting as light in the menorah. So we know in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then in the temple, the the menorah was commanded to be lit at all times because it represented the presence of God. Then, of course, we all know that Yeshua is the light of the world. So let's look at John 1, 9 and see what that says about Yeshua. John 1, 9 says this. This is John the Baptist speaking of Yeshua. It says, He was the true light which enlightens every man coming in to the world. Yeshua is the true light. And then in John 8, 12, Flip over to John 8, 12. It says, Therefore Yeshua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. Yeshua is the exact image and representation of God and the Word of God made flesh. He is the light of the world. And then we see at the very end of Scripture, and I love this. Turn with me to Revelation 21, 23. This is amazing. Of course, it's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. Starting in verse 22, of Revelation 21, it says, And I saw no dwelling place in it, for Jehovah El Shaddai is its dwelling place and the Lamb. And the city had no need of the sun, nor of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God lightened it, and the Lamb is its lamp. So first, we see very clearly that God is the source of light. Well, next, Scripture reveals this, that God's Word is light. We all know this probably by heart. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Then in Proverbs 6, 23, it says, For the command is a lamp, and the Torah is light. So God's Word is light because it gives us revelation. So before we talk about the third way light is used, we need to understand the purpose of light. Now, we all know that in general terms, light gives us revelation. It illuminates or makes things visible in the world around us so that we can see what is real. We can see reality. Now, if I could turn off all the lights and I could make it completely dark in here, then I would, but it's kind of challenging to do. Then if I ask one of you to stand up and to describe the room in vivid detail, you would not be able to do it. Although you're in the room, 
You're not able to describe the room in vivid detail because there's no light. You cannot see what's going on around you. Even if you tried, even if you started explaining things and you started explaining what Cindy is wearing and what Charles is wearing and where people are sitting, other people around you may believe you because they can't see either, but that doesn't mean what you're saying is actually lined up with reality. It's only when we flip on the lights and we can all see that you can give an accurate description of what is and other people around you can validate what you are seeing. And that's what we see going on in the world around us. People are walking in darkness and they're trying to explain this world and how things came to be, but they're in darkness. They don't have light. They don't have revelation. And many other people in darkness believe them but it's only when you're walking in the light are you able to see reality and see the truth. And that's what God's Word does for us. So the purpose of light is to reveal truth, the reality of what actually exists. And we know that the Word of God reveals the truth. The truth about God, the truth about us, the truth about creation, the truth about eternity. So people can say and people can believe whatever they want, and we know they do, but that doesn't change the reality of what is. Now, verse 8, it says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Master. Just like at the beginning of Genesis, all of us were in that place. All of us were living in darkness. We all began our lives in darkness. And so now we know what light is. Well, now we can ascertain that darkness is just an absence of God's presence. It's an absence of His revelation and His truth. Well, when we were in darkness, we belonged to the enemy. And he was blinding us from the truth. And this is important to remember. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 say this. It says, And indeed, if our good news has been veiled, it has been veiled in those who are perishing, in whom the mighty one of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Did you get that? The God of this age, the enemy, is blinding the minds of the unbelieving so that the enlightening or the light of the good news of the glory of Messiah, who is the likeness of God, does not shine on them. Well, that's how we all began, right? But then we went through a change, and God revealed His truth to us, and we understood and responded to that gospel message. And by the grace of God, we all experience the forgiveness of our sins. And He made us alive as a new creature in Messiah. And we were brought into a covenant relationship with God into the new covenant. And this is really, really important. So as part of the new covenant, God put two things inside of us. Have you ever thought about that? God put two things inside of you if you are in the new covenant by the blood of Messiah. What are they? Audience participation. What two things did he put inside of each one of us? His Holy Spirit. And what else? His Word. He's put His Holy Spirit. So we see that in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, and also John 14, 16, and 7 that His Spirit is in us. Well, He didn't just do that. He also put His Word, His Torah on our hearts. That's what the New Covenant says. John 31, verses 33, says that He wrote His Torah on our hearts. And here's the key. Both of these things are sources of light. That was our first two answers to our question. How does Scripture define light? God is light, meaning His Spirit is light, and His Word is light. And both of those things are inside of us. So that leads us to the third answer to our question, how does Scripture define light? 
God's people are light. First, the children of Israel were called to be light to the nations, right? You all familiar with Isaiah 49, 6? Well, the presence of God dwelled with them, right? We saw that with the pillar of fire, the presence of God was with them, and He gave His Word to them, both sources of light. And He did that so they could reveal the truth of God and His plan of redemption to the nations, so they could be vessels of His light to the nations. Well, as believers and followers of Messiah, for all of us that are in the new covenant by the blood of Messiah, His Spirit dwells inside of us, and His Word is written on our hearts. So we are the light of the world. And that's exactly what Yeshua says in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world, for it is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain. He says, so light your lamp. He talks about don't put it under a basket. He says, but put it on a lampstand so it shines to all those in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and praise your Father who is in the heavens. We are the light because we bear His Spirit and His Word. So as the children of the light, verse 9 of Ephesians 5 says the evidence or the fruit of God's presence in our lives is goodness, righteousness, and truth. So let's talk about each one of those briefly. Goodness is to do good. And good in Scripture, this is something Dr. Baruch always says, Good in Scripture is always related to the will of God and defined by the Word of God. So the evidence of God's light in you is doing good works that are pleasing to God according to His Word and according to His will. Now righteousness. The Torah God's instructions define God's standards of righteousness. And we all look to God's Word to define what's right and wrong. That's what defines right and wrong, and that's why the world has so much trouble. It's not that they have trouble. They just can't define right and wrong because they've disregarded the standard of right and wrong. So the fruit or the evidence of walking in the light is walking in obedience to God's Word and doing what is right in His eyes. And then the truth. That's the third piece of fruit or evidence that we're walking in the light. God's Word is truth. His Word defines the truth, the reality of what was, what is, and what is to come. So for us as believers who possess the Spirit of the living God, who have the Word of God written on our hearts, we know what is good and what is evil. We know what is right and wrong. We know the truth. So our purpose is to reveal the truth of God and His Word to a world living in darkness so that they can know the truth and the truth can make them free. So we need to proclaim the truth even when it's not a popular message. Well, the truth is that the Bible is the inerrant truth of God's Word to man. The truth is that the universe and the earth were created by God in seven days. Well, the Torah reveals the reality of who God is, who we are, and how the world came to be. So if someone believes in evolution, that we all evolved from a single cell, cell, they're walking in darkness because that's not reality. If they believe that we all evolved from that single cell, then we have no meaning in life. And everything's just happenstance. 
If we have no meaning, and we as humans are just more intelligent members of the animal kingdom, then what's wrong with abortion? If we're not, if you don't believe that we're created in the image of God, and that our life has meaning, purpose, and value, then what's, what's wrong with abortion? What's wrong with ending someone's life? Because there's no standard of righteousness. So there's no standard of what's right and wrong. Well, the Torah defines these things for us, and that's why it's so damaging and so dangerous that many, even within the church, have discouraged reading the Torah. And some have even gone as far to disregard it and disown it. It's the book of Genesis. It's the Torah that reveals the truth of our existence. And the truth is that all people, all people were made in, in, in the image of God. The truth is that abortion is the murder of an unborn human life. Amen. The truth is that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. You're one or the other and you don't get to choose and you don't get to change it. Amen. The truth is that marriage is between one man and and one woman. The truth is that homosexuality is wicked and that sin is disobedience to God's law. The truth that God's word reveals is that everyone, everyone has sinned and is destined for eternity separated from God. And the truth is that there is only one way to the Father and that this is through His Son, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The truth is that Yeshua is coming back on a white horse with a double-edged sword in His mouth, protruding out of His mouth, and He will bring judgment like we haven't seen all throughout the Old Testament. You know, sometimes I have that conversation about the God of wrath of the Old Testament and the peace-loving Jesus of the New Testament will read Revelation. And it'll give you a whole new picture of Yeshua, of Jesus. And the truth is that only those who are in a covenant relationship with God through the blood of Messiah Yeshua will enter the kingdom of God. And that all else are going to spend eternity in the torment of hell. And that's a really sobering reality. But that is the truth that God's word reveals. And that's the truth that the world has rejected. So as children of the light, we need to be bold and proclaim the truth. You're not standing on your own authority. You're standing on the authority of the Word of God. You're standing, when we say in the name of Yeshua, we're saying in the authority of Yeshua. And He's already overcome. And He dwells in us, so we are victorious. Just as light overtakes darkness in the room, so the light of God in you will overtake the darkness around you. But the only way that darkness can overtake you is if you choose to hide the light by walking in sin and darkness. That's why Paul says in verses 11 through 14, let's reread those. Ephesians 5, 11 through 14. He says, And have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather convict or expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of what is done by them in secret. But all matters being convicted or exposed are manifested by the light, and for whatever is manifested is light. That is why he says, wake up, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Messiah shall shine on you. So fellowship means to participate in the fruitless works of darkness. Now, did you catch the contrast? Earlier in the verse, I think verse 9, he says, the fruit of walking the light is goodness, righteousness, and truth. 
Well, he compares that with the fruitless works of darkness. Well, if you have a citrus tree in your yard, how many of you grow, have a citrus tree in your yard? Or really a tree of any sort, any fruit bearing anything, it is dependent on light in order to grow. If it doesn't have light, it will not bear fruit and it will die. So that's what he's saying here. So what are the fruitless works of darkness? Well, he's already answered that question in verse 3 through 5. He says, Whoring in all uncleanness or greed of gain, let it not even be named among you, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather thanksgiving. And then if you flip over a couple of pages to Galatians 5, flip back. There we go. Flip back a couple of pages to Galatians 5. That's where Paul compares the works of darkness, the works of the flesh, with the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Verse 19 of Galatians 5 says, The works of the flesh are well known. Adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency, idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, quarrels, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like. Those are the fruitless works of darkness. And Paul says that it's a disgrace to even talk about what some people do in hiding. And these acts are so shameful, not just because they're outside of the will of God, but because they are against the will of God. These are rebellious acts. They're flying in the face of God's Word. So Paul commands us not just to not participate in the wickedness, but to expose the wickedness to the light. Now here's a question I have. When he says, expose the wickedness to the light, is he talking about in believers or in non-believers? Because if we're talking about non-believers, they're just doing what comes natural to them. They can't do righteousness. Right? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to really help us answer this question. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And in verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my letter not to keep company with those who whore. And I certainly did not mean with those of this world who whore, or with greedy of gain, or swindlers, or idolatries, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone called a brother, if he is one who whores, or greedy of gain, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are inside? And here's the key. But God judges those who are outside and put away the wicked from among you. So based on this, I agree with you all. I believe that he is talking about exposing darkness and other people who are a part of the fellowship who are on the inside. Now, as believers, this isn't something that we talk about very much, but as believers, we are called to judge one another. We are called to confront one another when somebody is in sin. Now, as Americans in the 21st century, that makes us feel really uncomfortable. Because a lot of us, and I'm saying us, 
live with the fear of man or fear of rejection. We don't want to be rejected by other people, especially by brothers and sisters in the Lord. So oftentimes, if we see somebody in sin, then we'll just either ignore it, turn the other way, or in some really bad situations, they will cover it up. But we are called to expose these works of darkness and our brothers and sisters. So now the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we expose works of darkness and fellow believers? Well, I'd say first and foremost, most often, just be yourself and shine the light. Being the light and simply doing what is right exposes the darkness. When you're walking in obedience to the Lord, then you are shining the light. And that will expose darkness around you. And the Spirit will bring conviction in the heart of a fellow believer if they're walking in darkness. So that's the first way. Just be yourself. Just shine the light. And naturally, it will expose darkness. But sometimes it is necessary to confront a person. To hold them accountable. But we do that with a couple of things in mind. Okay, Scripture does talk about this. So the first and foremost, we remove the plank out of our own eye. If you're going to confront somebody, you spend some time praying and fasting about that and ask the Lord to reveal to you if there is anything in your life that you need to repent of first. Then we approach people in a spirit of humility, meekness, and love. Okay? Galatians 6.1 talks about that. We don't approach people in a spirit of accusation, but in that spirit of grace with the motivation to restore that person. Now, Yeshua gives us instructions in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. So I'd encourage you to read those verses. So it talks about going to that person, just you and them alone, and go talk to them. And if they receive you, then you've gained a brother. But if they don't, then get someone else. Get another couple of people and go to that person together and talk to them with that spirit of meekness and humility because you want to restore them. You're doing it in gentleness and love because you want to bring them apart, back into the fellowship. Because that's the truth that we sometimes forget. Sin separates. Sin separates us from God, and sin separates us from one another. We tell our kids that all the time. If we sin against them or them against us, it creates a breach in that relationship. And it's only when we repent, we forgive, and we are reconciled, which are all three different things, can we be restored back into relationship. But it's important we go through the process. Next. In order to become an imitator of God, we walk precisely. Let's look back at Ephesians 5, chapter, or verse 15 through 17. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. He says, See then that you walk exactly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are wicked. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the desire of Jehovah is. So when he says walk precisely, he means walk exactly. Now to walk precisely means to be very careful how you live in order to be exact, precise, doing your utmost to live your life in obedience to God and his instructions. So this goes right along with what we've been talking about. To walk precisely means to walk in the light, to walk in the truth by do, being a doer of the word in order to shine the light of God's truth to the world. Now he continues. He puts some stipulations on it. He says, walk precisely or walk exactly. Not as unwise, 
but is wise. So let's talk about that for a moment. Foolish people are unwise because they're wasteful. They're careless because they lack purpose in life. Therefore, foolish people will spend their resources. And when I say resources, I mean time, money, energy. They'll spend those things on the things that satisfy their temporary pleasures. Now, recently I read about a fairly young man. He's probably about my age. Very decorated. One of the most decorated Olympians of all time. So you can imagine he made millions of dollars thus far in his life. Well, he was very careless with his spending. And he lived the party lifestyle. And so he was, li- he was spending his money on all sorts of inter- entertainment. You can only imagine all the things that he was spending his money on. But things that did not have any lasting value. He did not have any purpose or any longer term plan and really believed that the money was just going to keep coming in to fund his lifestyle. Well, now that, you know, he's peaked, he's kind of on the way down. He's married with two young children and he's living paycheck to paycheck trying to put his kids through school. And he actually, I read an article about this, he lives with a lot of regret because he wasted all of that money that he could have used to fund his children's education and their college and buy their house and do all of these things. And it was all wasted because he was careless, did not have a longer term purpose with his money and with his time. And that would be an example of living unwise or living foolishly. Well, in contrast, wise people have purpose. They are careful. They are intentional with their resources because they are seeking to accomplish a very specific purpose. Wise people understand God's will and use their time wisely to accomplish His will. So for us, as believers, if we want to walk as the wise, we need to first understand God's will. We need to understand God's will, both from a bigger, overarching perspective, His will for the last days, His will for us as believers, but also His will for each one of us. Because each one of us has a calling on our lives. Each one of us has been equipped to contribute to His overall will in a very specific way. So we need to understand the part that we play individually in accomplishing the Lord's overall will. That's really imperative. Then, once we understand that, we seek to use our resources in order to accomplish His will. Because God has given each of us specific resources to accomplish His will for our lives. We all have resources. He has given us spiritual gifts and talents. He's given us all money, some a lot more, some less, but we all have financial resources. And I would imagine that all of us throughout life make more money than what we actually need. And He has given all of us time. So as wise people who are seeking to walk in obedience to God's will, we need to be wise, especially with our time. And that's what Paul is teaching us. Redeeming the time because the days are wicked. The time that we have is a gift. And it has a purpose. And we all know that time goes by very quickly. How many of you feel like, wow, life has gone by so fast? Script, script, <laughs> scripture says that life is a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. But here's the truth that we often forget. What we do in this life with our time will impact eternity. So, we need to be a people who live with an eternal perspective. What do I mean by that? I mean simply we just 
realize that our life is so, so, so short. And eternity is forever. Amen. And truly what we do here impacts eternity. So when we have that eternal perspective, we will be wise with our time and with our money. And we will direct our time and money to those things that will help people enter into the kingdom of God, not waste them on things that have no lasting value. Now, Paul speaks again about this in 1 Thessalonians. So let's all turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 10. So here he's, in the end of verse 4, he's talking about the return of Messiah. So we're talking about the last days here. So in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Now, brothers, as to the times and the seasons, you do not need to be written to. For you yourselves know very well that the day of Jehovah comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But this is key. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. You are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then we should not sleep as others do, but we should watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But we who are of the day should be sober, putting on the breastplate of belief and love, and as a helmet, the expectation of deliverance. Because Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our Master Yeshua Messiah, who died for us, so that we, whether awake or asleep, should live together with him. So, in order to walk precisely, we live with an eternal perspective, seeking to understand God's will for our lives and seeking to use our resources to fulfill His purposes. Now, in order for us to do that, we have to be filled with the Spirit. We have to walk in the Spirit. So the third way that we become imitators of God is that we walk in the Spirit. So turn back to Ephesians 5, and let's read these last couple of verses together. Ephesians 5, verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, which is loose behavior, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to each other in psalms, and songs of praise and spiritual songs, singing and striking the strings in your heart to the Master, giving thanks always for all to God the Father in the name of our Master Yeshua Messiah. So in verse 18, Paul is drawing a contrast between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. So why does he make that comparison? What do those two things have in common? Well, he makes that comparison because both of those things have a very strong influence on you. Both of those things will control you if you let them. Now, when you're drunk with alcohol, you lose the ability. You lose the ability to discern between good and evil, and you make foolish choices. And that's what science will tell you, that when you get drunk, the very first thing to go is your ability to make good judgments. So you lose the ability to discern between good and evil. And that will lead to foolish choices because you're focused on what feels good in the moment. And you lose that self-control and start doing things that you would never do when you're sober. And oftentimes, this is what leads to sexual immorality. 
And it's sad to think how many young, young people, 18-year-olds, just went off to college and are now living the party scene and are being exposed to alcohol, sometimes for the first time. And they're getting drunk and they're making decisions that they're going to regret for the rest of their lives. Because that's what happens when we are drunk with wine. On the contrary, when you're filled with the Spirit, you gain the ability to discern between good and evil. And you make wise choices. You are wise with your time and your resources in order to accomplish the will of God. So we want to become wise imitators of God. Walking in the light of God's Word and being filled with the light of His Holy Spirit. So we need to be filled with His Spirit. But how do we do that? Well, earlier I referenced the temple, right? And the menorah in the temple. Well, the priest had a very specific responsibility to keep that lamp burning, right? Because it was a, it was a picture of the presence of God. So how did they do that? What did the priest do to keep that menorah burning? Well, they did two things primarily. They kept the lamp filled with oil, which is representative of the Holy Spirit, and they trimmed the wicks. And by doing those two things, they were able to keep the light of the menorah burning. So for us to be stay filled with His Spirit and to walk in the Spirit, we need to spend time each day in His Word and in prayer. We read His Word. We study His Word to gain revelation, to bring light to our understanding so we know His will for our lives. And then in prayer, we trim the wick, so to speak, by asking the Lord to reveal sin in our lives so that we can repent and that we can seek to align our lives according to His truth. And here's what Paul tells us in verse 19 and verse 20. That when we are filled with the Spirit, it is evident in the way that you talk. Have you ever listened to someone talk? And I'm not going to you know, say any of us do this, but all they do is complain, or they talk about what's wrong, or it's just negativity just spewing out of their mouth. That's a sign of walking in darkness and not being filled with the Spirit. But have you ever you know, been around Lester and all he's just doing is like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, giving thanks for something else? That is walking in the Spirit, and it's evident by the way that you talk. So listen to yourself sometime. What are the things coming out of your mouth? What are the things that you're speaking? Are you speaking life? Are you speaking death? Because that is evidence that shows us whether or not we are filled with the Spirit. And if you notice that, then take some time in prayer and in His Word and ask Him to fill you with His Spirit and change the way that you talk. And when you're talking as being one filled with the Spirit, you praise God. That's what verse 19 is getting at. And verse 20 says that you thank God. So when we're filled with the Spirit, it comes out in praising God for who He is and what He has done in our lives. Thank you, Father. We all have things to praise Him about. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we give thanks to God for all things at all times. You notice that? It says all things at all times because He is the one who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the Master Yeshua, the Messiah. And that's what we have to remember. That He has blessed us in Messiah far beyond what we can imagine or what we deserve. So in response to His goodness, in response to His kindness, in response to His compassion in our lives, we seek to become imitators of Him as His beloved children. And we do that by walking in love. We do that by walking as children of the light. We do that by walking precisely, and we do that be, by being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. But it's a journey. 
It's a process. So give yourselves a lot of grace. Katie and I were talking about that yesterday. I'm having to give myself a lot of grace right now. We got a lot going on. Katie has to give herself a lot of grace. We got to give each other a lot of grace. Because it's a process. But in order to grow, Lester, you can go ahead and come on up. In order to grow, in order to become the imitator of God, we need to consider some of these questions. And they're in the back of your bulletin because I really want you to take these home. Spend some time now, but spend some time later. In prayer, reading through these questions, honestly asking the Holy Spirit to show you what's going on in your heart. Write down your answers. So what are some of the questions we want to ask ourselves? How are you shining the light to those in the darkness? All of us live in the world. We're in the world, we're not of the world. So we have opportunities every day to shine the light in the darkness. So how are you doing that? Ask yourself, what is God's will for your life? How has He equipped you? What resources has He given you? What spiritual gifts has He given you to contribute to accomplishing His overall will? Are you living with that eternal perspective? Are you seeking to use your time, money, energy to accomplish His will? How much time do you spend in His presence each day? Are you spending time each and every day reading His Word and in prayer, just in His presence, allowing Him to speak to you as you're talking with Him in order to be filled with His Spirit? Well, this is an opportunity, and I always want to give us an opportunity to, to respond. Because I like to say this, that we're not here for information. We're not here for biblical facts and knowledge. Those are necessary. But we're not here for information. We're here for transformation. We're here because we want to change. We want to be conformed to the image and likeness of Messiah. We want to be imitators of God. So take some time. Think through these questions and pray. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you where He wants you to grow so that you can become an imitator of God as His beloved child. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You for Your tremendous grace and compassion in our lives. We thank you for the blood of Messiah, which has cleansed us of all sin. We thank you that you have put your spirit in us, that you have written your very word in our hearts, that you have put your light in us. So help us, Lord, to trim the wick, to fill our lamps with oil so that we can be filled with your spirit and shine the light to those around us. Father, help us understand your will for each one of us and to be more intentional with how we use our time. Be more intentional with how we use our money, how we use our energy in order to accomplish your specific will for our lives. We thank you that you are with us, that you're in us, that you're leading, guiding, and directing us. So help us, Lord, to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit each and every day. We love you and we thank you. We pray for a powerful anointing to come over this place right now that you would reveal to each one of us here how you want us to change and grow to become an imitator of you. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.